This is a lecture about electron configurations, and it's the first of two lectures from Chapter 8. Just briefly before I get going on electron configurations, I want you to be aware of a little bit of the history of the periodic table. So the first person to arrange the known elements in any type of order was a dude named Mendeleev. And Mendeleev ordered the elements that were known in his time by atomic mass. And he noticed when he did so that elements that were in the same ended up being like a vertical column had similar properties. So he called this periodic behavior the periodic law. And during his time, there were only a handful of elements known. Of course, now we have something like 118 or something. But he, because of that, he was able to predict elements that were as yet undiscovered. So pretty cool. Um, there were just a couple of elements out of place, and that was taken care of by a scientist named John Mosley. He just made a few changes so that the elements were arranged by atomic number, number of protons, instead of mass. It only changed the place of four or five elements. But um, everything fell into place, and that is representative of our current periodic table. All right, so the general notation that we use for electron configuration is shown here. This happens to be the electron configuration for hydrogen. So the first thing you want to do when you're getting ready to write an electron configuration is find out how many electrons the element has. In any type of neutral atom, which is what we're dealing with at this point, unless you're told otherwise, assume it's neutral, the number of electrons equal the number of protons. Hydrogen has one electron. And so every electron configuration, every orbital, is represented first by a number, which tells you the um, primary energy level that that electron resides in, okay. primary energy level. And that primary energy level also represents the period on the periodic table. So energy level one is representative of electrons that you're placing in the first energy level, the first row of the periodic table. After the number comes the, um, the type of orbital that the electron is in. And so that will be um, either S, P, D, or F. And finally, the exponent represents the number of electrons that are in that particular orbital or sublevel. It's also important that you understand what an orbital diagram is and that you know how to write it. So often you will see electron configurations accompanied by an orbital diagram, which is simply more of a visual representation. So in an orbital diagram, you will see this square, and the square represents an orbital. Every orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. That's important to know. That doesn't mean they have to have two electrons. They can have one or zero, but the maximum is two. The arrows inside the boxes in the orbital diagram represent the electrons. So our convention is that an electron that is, or an arrow that is pointing upwards represents an electron in that orbital that is spinning clockwise, and an arrow pointing downwards is representing an electron that is spinning counterclockwise. And finally, I will mention this again a little bit later in the PowerPoint, but if you do have two electrons in an orbital, the spins must be opposite. One must be clockwise, one must be counterclockwise. Before we actually start writing electron configurations, there are three rules that you must be aware of. The first rule is called the Aufbau Principle. And the Aufbau Principle simply says an electron will go into the lowest energy orbital first. And there is a very strict ordering of orbitals from lowest energy to highest energy. And this flat out must be memorized. So um, you either want to write down this ordering. Um, this is the lowest energy, 1s. And then it continues to go up, of course. You either want to memorize the order of energy levels or 
A tool that some people prefer to use is called the Aufbau diagram, which I'll explain how to use now. If you don't want to use the Aufbau diagram, you can go on to the next slide. But basically what you do is you write um, the S orbitals all to the left in a vertical column, starting with one. And then you skip a space and put all of the, t the P orbitals, beginning with 2P, straight up. And then skip a space again. And all the D orbitals, skip a space again, then the F. And so the important thing is how to read the Aufbau diagram. You must read it on the diagonal. And I'm going to write out the energies of these orbitals in order as I show you how to read the Aufbau diagram. So starting at the 1s, going diagonally. So 1s is the lowest energy level. When you finish a diagonal row, go back down to the beginning of the next row. And then go through the diagonal. So next in energy is 2s. Go back to the bottom, and see now we're going through 2P and 3S. So I'll say 2P, 3S, and I'll do just a couple more. Then 3P, 4S, 3P, 4S, and 3D, 4P, 5S. That's where it gets a little tricky and might be helpful. 3D, 4P, 5S. Now I want to point a couple things out. So you can either, as I said, write this string of orbitals and memorize it or learn to use the orbital diagram. And if you do, actually, honestly, if you practice enough electron configurations, it'll automatically get memorized. So I want to point out a couple of anomalies. So notice that we have 3s and 3p. And then instead of having 3D right after 3P, here's 4S kind of interrupting the three, the 3 energy level. That is a typical pattern. So for example, if I was going to um, continue this energy level, after 5S would become 4D. And so you can see the same thing here. Breaking up the 4P and 4D is the 5S. And so that's just kind of a little glitch that's important for you to remember. And again, you'll get more comfortable with this ordering the more you practice. So we'll move on. So here's our first rule, Aufbau principle. The second rule when writing electron configurations is the Pauli exclusion principle. So kind of the textbook definition is no two electrons in an atom has the same four quantum numbers. So think of Quantum numbers is kind of a fingerprint for each electron. But a simpler way to state the Pauli exclusion principle, and my um, preferred, <clears throat> is that what it's really saying is that if you have two electrons in an orbital, they must have opposite spins. And if that's the case, all electrons will end up having unique four quantum numbers. So how that question is often asked in multiple choice is they'll give you a bunch of diagrams and say, which one of these electron or orbital diagrams violates the Pauli exclusion principle? And what you want to look for is the diagram that shows two electrons in the same orbital with the same spin. Okay, that is not allowed. Okay, so again, if you have two electrons in any one orbital, they must have opposite spin, one up, one down. The third and last rule to follow in writing electron configurations is Hund's rule. That rule is the one that tends to trip students up. So this is the one you kind of want to pay close attention to. What it says basically is when you are putting electrons in equal energy orbitals. So let's pause for a minute. What do I mean by equal energy orbitals? If you are in a sublevel that has more than one orbital, for example, hopefully you remember that the P sublevel has three orbitals. And if we were to have, let's say, the 3D sublevel, anytime you have a D sublevel, you're talking about five orbitals. Okay, so anytime you're putting electrons in a P, D, or F sublevel, they all have more than one orbital. You want to put one electron in each of those equal energy orbitals before you pair any of them up. 
So again, a typical multiple choice question would be which of these diagrams violates Hund's rule? It would be the diagram where somebody started pairing up electrons before each of the equal energy orbitals had an electron. So that's not allowed. This would be the preferred method. And just to give you a brief reason, electrons have a charge, right, a negative charge. So they don't really want to be paired up, be close to each other, and repel each other until they have to. If you're like me and you like to see all of the rules in one place, this would be the slide for you. I just put the three rules we went over in one place in case you want to put them on one note card or something. All right, so just as a reminder when we're, we're getting real close to writing electron configurations, I promise... So again, if you're talking about an S sublevel, you're talking about one orbital. So an S sublevel can only hold a maximum of two electrons. A P sublevel, on the other hand, contains three orbitals. Each of those orbitals can hold two electrons. So a P sublevel can hold a maximum of six electrons. In a similar fashion, a D sublevel can hold a maximum of 10 electrons, and an F sublevel can hold a maximum of 14 electrons. That'll be important in our electron configurations. All right, so let's do an example. As I said at the beginning of the PowerPoint, the first thing you want to do is determine how many electrons the element has. Look at the periodic table. Find the atomic number, the number of protons, and we're assuming everything's neutral unless you are told otherwise. So you have to remember the ordering of the energy levels, <clears throat> and then you begin to place electrons in each of these energy levels, starting with the lowest and moving up higher, by putting subscripts, superscripts, showing the number of electrons in the orbital. And these numbers were supposed to be superscripts, and they didn't transfer over. So you're going to end up with an electron configuration that kind of looks like this. And once you have placed all of the electrons, you simply stop. How do you know how many electrons that you have placed so far? You add up the superscripts. So if I were to add up all of the superscripts that I have in this notation here... Let's see, 6 plus 2 is 8, 14, 16, 22, 24, 26. I have placed 26 electrons so far. And so again, just keep placing the electrons till you get to the total number of electrons in the element. Here are the electron configurations, really simple ones for the first five elements on the periodic table. So hydrogen only has one electron. 1s1, helium has 2, 1s2. Once you reach 1s2, you've totally filled the, the 1s sublevel, so you need to go to the next orbital, which is 2s. And so, as you can see here, you just keep on trucking. You've got boron, which has 5 electrons, so you've added 2 plus 2 plus 1 equals 5 electrons. Notice that even though p sublevels hold a maximum of 6 electrons, it's perfectly okay to have fewer than six. It just depends on how many an element needs. Be sure that you know not only how to... Oh, man, this slide got messed up. When I import into this um, program to make my pre-recorded lectures, I should check the... Um, so, see, that's supposed to be a superscript. Okay, that's 1s2. Wowee. Anyway, I'm going to just cross that out. That'll confuse you. So make sure that you know how to draw the orbital configurations as well as the um, electron configuration. I'm just going to do one of them for you to make sure here. So fluorine. Fluorine has nine electrons. And so if you were to write out the electron configuration for fluorine, it would be 1s2, 2s2... 2p5. And so that would be the correct electron configuration. If I asked you to write the orbital configuration, 
all you have to do is make sure you draw the right number of boxes. So the 1s level has only one orbital, so it has one box. Okay, It has two electrons in it. Then you have the 2s orbital. Again, it's s sublevel, so it only has one orbital. And then we move on to the 2p sublevel. So you draw all three orbitals in the p sublevel. Even if they're empty, you still draw them. There are five electrons that fluorine has in the p sublevel. Remember Hunt's rule when you place the electrons. So one electron in each of these equal energy orbitals before you pair them. So that's one, two, three so far, four, five. Okay, and so that would be the orbital configuration for fluorine. Once you're able to write out a few basic electron configurations, probably the most important concept you can try to grasp is the relationship between electron configurations and the arrangement of the periodic table. This could be a little abstract and a little tricky to grasp, but so you may need to spend time on it. But here's a periodic table with portions of each electron configuration um, drawn, the end portion, the highest energy portion of each element's electron configuration drawn. I want you to look column by column, group by group, and see what each group of elements in the periodic table has in common relative to its electron configuration. Hopefully you can see that all of the elements in group 1A have an electron configuration that ends in S1. So a lot of people will call that the S1 group. Similarly, all of the elements in group 2A have an electron configuration that ends in S2. Now it's only the energy levels that are different, okay? 2S2, 3S2, 4S2. Um, you can go all the way through, and let me just label these, D1, D2, D3, etc., all the way to D10. Now we start with the P's. All of these in group 3A end in P1, P2, etc., all the way to P6. And so what you will often see is scientists will label these particular blocks on the periodic table as, for example, the S block, the first two columns, the D block, and the P block, and then not to be totally neglectful, the lanthanides and actinides, the F block. Okay, so all of their electron configurations end in F. That's really, really important. Once you understand that trend, you no longer have to memorize the ordering of the energy levels for orbitals in electron configuration. You can simply look at a periodic table and right away be able to figure out what the electron configuration for any element is. If you can do that, you're in really good shape. You have mastered this topic. There are some electron configurations that are irregular. They are unexpected. And what I want you to do is pull out a periodic table, and I want you to find chromium and copper on that periodic table. They are both in the D block. They're both transition metals. And I want you to take a minute and write out what you think the electron configuration would be for both chromium and copper. What you should get for chromium, and my exponents are still not transferring here, what you should get for chromium is the electron configuration at the end looks something like 4s2, 3d4. And it turns out that that's not accurately, that's not actually the correct electron configuration for chromium. What it is, is 4s1, 3d5. It turns out that there is a particular stability in a sublevel that is either halfway full or completely full. So chromium and all of the elements below it in that uh, family of D elements 
have these unexpected electron configurations where essentially the D sublevel has snatched an electron from the adjacent S sublevel. And as a result, the D sublevel and the S sublevel are both halfway full. So it's kind of a similar story with copper. So if you were to write out the expected electron configuration for copper, you would get 4S2, 3D9. Turns out, again, that is not accurate. The copper, the actual copper electron configuration ends in 4S1, 3D10. And again, that's because of stability reasons. A completely full sublevel is particularly stable. And so when you have basically a D sublevel that is only one away from being either completely full or halfway full, that sublevel will steal an electron from the adjacent S sublevel. And so this is just something you kind of have to memorize. So now we're going to memorize what we call the shorthand way of writing electron configurations. They're also referred to as the noble gas electron configurations. And in order to be effective at doing this, you need to be able to understand that relationship I talked about between placement of elements on the periodic table and their electron configuration. So we're going to look at the shorthand electron configuration for sodium. And I'm going to write it out again because my superscripts are not showing. There we go. So there's the longhand, whoops, I left out S. There's the longhand electron configuration for sodium. It has 11 electrons, okay, atomic number 11. And if you were to write the shorthand, the general procedure is that you find the noble gas, that's um, one of the gases in group 8A to the far right of the periodic table, and you put that noble gas in brackets, and what that notation is telling the reader is that the symbol for the element in brackets means that all of the electron configuration for neon. And so all the only electron configuration you need to actually write out is any electron configuration beyond past neon up to the element you're trying to write, which in this case is sodium. And so if you look at the whole electron configuration for sodium, the first, let's see, from 1s2 up through 2p6 is actually the electron configuration for neon. And all that's left then, all that's unique, is 3s1. And so the shorthand electron configuration for sodium is right here, neon, followed by 3s1. That's it. Let's practice another one. Let's say that I told you to write the electron configuration out for chlorine. Chlorine has, if you look at its atomic number, it has 17 electrons, atomic number 17. And so let's write the shorthand for it. If you remember the rules, rule one was go to group 8A and find the noble gas before the element of interest and put it in brackets. So it's neon again. All right, so now we've taken care of all parts of the electron configuration up through neon. So we go to the element beyond neon, which is right here, and we have to write the electron configuration for, let's see, for these elements up through chlorine. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Well, these two boxes, 3s2, so we need to write that. We're in the third energy level. And then we skip over here. Remember, this is the P block. So we have P1, P2, P3, P4, P5. So 3P5, and that's it. That is the shorthand electron configuration for chlorine. It may help you to look over these um, shorthand electron configurations for several of the elements 
Um, here's chlorine, which we just did. Okay. But you should pick a couple of them. Maybe go ahead and try argon or sulfur um, and make sure that you can do it. One of the things I want to mention and emphasize before the end of this lecture are valence electrons. Um, you have learned how to, whoopsie, how to draw electron configurations for neutral elements, but you will also need to occasionally write electron configuration for ions. So I'm hoping that you remember that an ion is simply a charged particle, and how do you get from a neutral element to an ion? Ions are formed by either adding or taking away electrons. And typically, it's the valence electrons, the electrons in the highest energy shell, that are messed with when you're making an ion. And so um, with that introduction, I'm going to show you briefly how to write electron configurations for a few ions. All right, so the last two slides, I'm going to um, show you how to write an electron configuration for an ion. And I think it's probably worth reminding you the charges that elements tend to get when they become ions. So remember that all elements have a drive to become noble gas-like. The noble gases, that's the elements in group 8A, have eight valence electrons, okay? So it means that their outer shell is full. So if you were to look at the electron configurations for a noble gas, all of them would end with a notation that's some S2P6. So it would be, there we go. So for example, it might be 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6, but all of the noble gases have an electron configuration that shows that the valence um, shell is totally full of electrons, which is very stable. So when the other A group elements become ions, okay, so we're not talking about the transition metals, but all of the other A group ones, they either gain or lose enough electrons so that their valence shell, their outer shell of electrons is full and is similar to a noble gas electron configuration. So hopefully you've memorized these in the past and you remember, but group 1A, when they become an ion, have a charge of plus one, which means they've lost their one and only valence electron. Group 2A has a charge of plus two as an ion. This is only when they become ions, okay? Only when they start to chemically react. And group 2A has two valence electrons, so when they become ions, they've lost both of those valence electrons. Group 3A becomes uh, cations with a plus three charge. Group 4A doesn't tend to become ions, that's the carbon group. Group 5A, starting with nitrogen, when they become ions, have a charge of minus three, which means they have gained three additional valence electrons. So the nitrogen group starts with five valence electrons and they gain three more when they become an ion, which gives them a full outer shell of eight valence electrons. Okay. Similar situation with the oxygen group. They gain two electrons when they become ions to have a charge of minus two. And finally, the halides, halogens become uh, minus one charge. Noble gases are already very stable. They don't tend to become ions. Okay, so what if I were to ask you to draw the electron configuration for the sodium, the most common ion for sodium, and the most common ion for, let's see, sulfur? How would you go about doing that? Well, this is where you would have to remember the charges the elements have when they become ions. Sodium's in group 1A. The group in 1A tend to become ions with charge of plus one. Sulfur is in the oxygen group. When they become ions, they have charges of minus two. Now, the next thing to discuss is what does a plus one charge mean as far as electron configuration goes? That means you have one less electron. 
than the neutral sodium. So how many electrons does neutral sodium have? If you look at the periodic table, its atomic number is 11, and so the sodium ion has 10 electrons. So you would write the electron configuration for sodium, placing only 10 electrons instead of 11. So it would look like 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Okay, and you stop. You might notice that that is the electron configuration for neon. And so that just kind of confirms what I said a couple slides ago, that all elements, when they become an ion, try to be noble gas-like. They all end up with an electron configuration of the noble gas that they are closest to. Let's look at sulfur. A minus charge means that there have been additional electrons added. Sulfur has a, an atomic number 16, so when it is neutral, it has 16 electrons. In its ionic state, it has 18 electrons, okay, two additional ones. And so if you were to write out the electron configuration for sulfur, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, let's see, how many have I used so far? I've used 10 electrons so far, so I'll keep on trucking. 3s2, 3p6, and now I have placed a total of 18 electrons, so I am done, and here is the electron configuration for the ion of sulfur. Again, notice that it has the same electron configuration as a noble gas, in this case, krypton. And that will be the case for every single common ion for the group A elements that you make. That's it for this lecture.